Those who grew up in the 90s will obviously recognize this sound effect. It's the sound effect of a dial-up modem booting up and gaining internet access if you were up to uh, use one back in the day. For many, this will be deeply ingrained in people's brains as it was the entryway to the internet. Back then when the internet had you looking up for your favorite doom facts on the Yahoo search engine in between a dozen or so animated GIFs and background media music through QuickTime. Ah yes, the memories. The dial-up modem sound is an easily recognizable sound that always sounded the same since it worked the same way. It dialed to your ISP through your phone line and then it made all sorts of audible adjustments to connect you to the outside network. That's why the dial-up modem sound was not just jarring to listen to but also very awkwardly nostalgic. So nostalgic in fact that it became ingrained deep into the internet culture of today even becoming part of memes. This is my voice one day on watching the weather channel. This is my voice, two days on watching the Weather Channel. This is my voice, one week on watching the Weather Channel. And the 90s was a source of for so many nostalgic sound effects and audiovisual ASMR, and the dial of modem sound was not the only one invading our inner collective psyche. You need to admit that this was the sound that plagued your mind when you grew up gaming in the 90s. The PlayStation startup jingle. Funnily enough, it was even sampled in Lil B's Landlord more recently alongside with other tracks like Master Striker's Sunny Boogie which was probably the more direct and more recognizable use of the sample. This sound in a PlayStation startup was designed as a way to tell a user of the console if the disc was read right and there's no errors written in a PlayStation disc. For instance, when the disc is correctly read, the second part with a then the ding 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 goes on and gets to play the actual game. I've done my extensive research into the topic of the PlayStation startup sound thanks to the PlayStation blog as an official source, and I guess like this can't turn wrong, isn't it? Uh, does ignore the link of this video, it's fine. According to the PlayStation official blog, and given that it's the blog article that keeps getting repeated in either Google or DuckDuckGo multiple times when I was doing research on this topic, the original composer for the PlayStation startup sound was a man by the name of Takafumi Fujisawa. This blog article is an interview at the Game Informer made by Jeff Quirk to the composer himself. Takafumi Fujisawa was part of the PlayStation project even before the team was official. As the hardware development progressed and the prototype was built in 1994, he created the startup sound based on the motion logo included with it. He wasn't given too many restrictions at the time of creating the startup sound save for the size of the ROM itself which made the sound size minimal. Originally there was an alternative version with a voice whispering PlayStation layer on top which probably was later repurposed on PlayStation commercials back in the day, but imagining it will be kinda creepy that the console spoke to you directly, they just went with the whisperless version instead. <laughs> Too creepy for PlayStation? Gee, imagine that! Fujisawa used a commonly used synth for composing this, the Roland D50, a keyboard synth that will define the sound of the later 80s and the early 90s era. It featured a joystick for easy sound manipulation and onboard chorus effect and was the first synth to feature onboard reverb. It was revered by producers and composers for how closely it was able to emulate real instruments and it pretty much sounds like this. that if you dial up the patch spacious sweep in the synth, you get a complex resonant pad grid for adding depth. Then you play some bass notes and this is what you get. This is the same instrument in the Roland D50 especially play on, played on just two notes, G and then C. I just look it up on hooktheory.com, don't ask me. 
It's incredibly noticeable that Fujisawa has talent for creating one of the most iconic sounds in video game history from the 90s, and but Fujisawa also composed for other games as well, including some for the PS1. He composed the music for mainly four games, Ark the Lad, Hot Shots Whatever 2, Intelligent Q, wow, one of my childhood games, and Omega Boost, are all according to John Bomb. He has a lot more unspecified credits and plenty of other games too, including Parappa the Rapper. And it even goes way back into the SNES era when he started composing music, especially for a company called Sony ImageSoft, one of the predecessors to Sony Computer Entertainment. In this game, it's copyrighted as Sony Music Entertainment 1991, and the game is called Extra Innings, known in Japan as Gamba League. It's a run of the mill baseball video game for the SNES, it seems. The game was released on August 9th, 1991, months later after Sony made its North American division, Sony Electronic Publishing. Later on, the Sony Computer Entertainment will be founded, and with it, the PlayStation will be born, who would get to hear the legendary startup sound. So yeah, that is the story of the legendary PlayStation startup sound. Just ignore the rest of the length of the video, it's not real. Subscribe for more epic content like this, and I'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Are they going now? Good, they're gone. The following information has already costed my livelihood enough to put myself at risk. What you're about to watch is sensitive information that could also put your life in danger. Please watch at your own caution. So after I took my pertinent research for the PS1 startup sound for this video, I met a gigantic dead end. There was not much anything else in terms of finding who really made the PlayStation startup sound. It was very apparent and definite that Takafumi Fujisawa was the one who made that sound, and I didn't find too many counter arguments against it, so uh, I wasn't really desperate. In fact, in the words of famous film director George Lucas, I went too far in a few places. The sort of rabbit hole I got myself into after this, in fact, was so fucked up and bonkers that with this information at hand, all I knew was that the internet as a whole was fucked. This is the sort of stuff that will destroy the internet as a whole, and I'll explain it in a while after this, but this part is the fucked up part. So, after I went desperate with trying to make some research for this video, I just fore left it in limbo, hoping it will get back to it eventually. Browsing through YouTube, I never expected the current trends of technology to get so dire, with the advent of AI art and the sort of skyrocketing and causing so much discourse online. But I found a couple of totally not grifter YouTubers or so who were promoting an online app called ChatGPT. If I were to tell you that in 12 months time, you would never have to write a video script again or even use your brain to grow your YouTube channel, how would you feel? Yeah, I will definitely feel fantastic, but just me being replaced by a machine and replacing by a feeble flesh brain into the certainty of steel. I want to be assimilated by pork, please. You don't need me to tell you how dire the situation of AI replacing creative jobs is, but apparently, a lot of people are so keen to accept the fate of creating people being replaced. It's like, it basically all these people were willing to get assimilated by Borg in the shout out of the Borg tomb. <laughs> the sheer enthusiasm this sorts of tech pro people have for easing the process as far as to turn off your brain to let the AI do the job for you is just baffling. I already discussed in a previous video how AI replacing creative talents is just apocalyptic, but I didn't expect these people still existing. The point is, these people seem to be using an app called ChatGPT to say, generate YouTube video scripts that go viral or coding video games on the sort, which still is pretty damn fucked. But somehow, I wanted to try it out just as a tad bit of an experiment. Maybe ChatGPT can definitely write a good YouTube video script that can easily speed up the process. And maybe it does as much as a fantastic natural job as I did. <laughs> Oh, Lord, help me. So I fell under the temptation 
because I needed to see if I could quote help me making a viral script for the PlayStation 1 startup sound and that I left it on hold at the moment and so I went with it. I wrote the prompt, write me a viral script for a 2 hour YouTube video essay about the PS1 startup sound and its history with something the audience doesn't know about it. I hit send and this was the AI gave me. Hello and welcome to the special 2 hour video YouTube video essay about this iconic PlayStation 1 startup sound. I don't think I'm supposed to say out loud that it was going to be a 2 hour YouTube video essay. For those who may not know, the PlayStation 1 was released in 1994 and quickly became one of the most popular gaming consoles of the time. And like, what many people may not know is that the startup sound played when turning on the console holds a significant place in gaming history. First off, let's take a listen to the startup sound that we all know and love. It's an audio clip of PS1 startup sound. That sound has become um, synonymous with the PlayStation brand and has been used in every PlayStation console since it debut. But where it did come from and how did it become such an iconic part of gaming culture? The startup sound was created by a composer Koji Kondo, who is best known for his work for the music for the Super Mario series. Kondo was approached by Sony to create a unique sound that will represent the PlayStation brand. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, just one second. Three hours later. What the fuck are you talking about? Okay, yes, I thought the same thing you. Is this it? Is Koji Kondo really behind the PS1 stirrup sound all along? Was PlayStation lying all about it all the time and told us that Kat Takafumi Fujisawa made it? I was just baffled. I couldn't honestly believe my eyes until I realized. This is just about a load of bullshit. I tried variations of the same chat GPT prompt over and over again, and it always brought up Koji Kondo with as the supposed creator of the PS1 startup sound. The pure chat GPT result went on like this. In an interview with IGN, Kondo explained his inspiration for the startup sound. He said that he wanted to create something that was both futuristic and timeless, and something that will be instantly recognizable for players. There's no absolute evidence of this IGN interview with Kondo saying he made the PS1 startup sound. It was all a lie made by an AI. So I was starting to turn insane. I, I knew I wanted to try to make a video about it, like H Bomber Guy, my senpai, like one of the the one of the Roblox oop sound. Hold on. That's it. I'm going to try this. What if I just did the same hypothetically for explaining the origin of the Roblox oof sound? You know, that all that shit with Messiah, Tommy, Tyler Rico, Joy Curious, see if the AI can come with it an identical to Harris's video. I wrote the prompt, write me a script for a 2 hour YouTube video essay about the history behind the Roblox oof sound and who really made that sound effect, and the result was the following. Hello and welcome to the two hour YouTube video essay. You're not supposed to say that, come on! One of the first professional sound designers to work on the oof sound was a man named Mike Moraski. Moraski was a veteran of the video game industry, having worked on sound design for several popular games, including Half Life 2 and Portal. Um. In 2006, Moraski was hired by Roblox to create a new oof sound, and he came up with a unique and memorable sound that was become iconic within the Roblox community. The sound he created is a combination of a low, guttural growl and a high-pitched whine, which perfectly captures a feeling of being injured or defeated in game. At this point, I realized that this is pretty much a load of baloney. Nowhere in the whole internet does it say that Mike Moraski, the composer for fucking Half-Life 2 and Portal, did make the famous Roblox oof sound like that. The AI was bullshitting me at this point. So I had to consult with a few people over Discord to know what the hell was going on, and some told me that the AI was basically pulling this information from all around the internet. So the AI might probably pull this out from very reputable sources, right? Foreshadowing is a narrative device in So let's analyze the reason why this ChatGPT AI is pulling this off. Turns out that yes, the AI is pulling off information from the whole internet, but not entirely. It's pulling off information from the current internet trending topics as we speak. This is what's written by the in the ChatGPT paper. 
to create a reward model for reinforcement learning, we needed to call, collect comparison data, which consisted of two or more model responses ranked by quality. To collect this data, we took conversations that AI trainers had with the chatbot, we randomly selected a model reading message, sampled several alternative completions, and had AI trainers rank them. Using these reward models, we can fine-tune the model using prox proximal policy optimization. We performed several iterations of this process. So to speak, the AI has been trained by human interaction, even from the very beginning, to come up with such responses. The AI paper continues as follows. The chat GPT sometimes writes possible sounding but incorrect or nonsensical answers. Fixing this issue is challenging as 1. During RL training, there's currently no source of truth. 2. Training the model to be more cautious causes it to decline questions that it can answer correctly. And 3. Supervised training misleads the model because the ideal answer depends on what the model knows rather than what the human demonstrator knows. So let me get this obviously straight. Considering that on the internet alone, there might be a bazillion shitposters possibly manipulating the AI at their whim, and either way the AI has been ever and even initially trained by the open AI programmers, it must be a load of rubbish. Also funny how they say supervised training misleads the model, that's just like saying supervising your child's learning misleads the child because the ideal answer depends on whatever fantasy nonsense that Kill believes rather than what responsible parents know. Who made this AI? Elon Musk? Okay, so JMA from the future here. I have to add this bit of an addendum right after I send the original audio to my editor, Wrangler, because this right now it smells fishy as hell. Uh, if you start asking questions to ChatGPT about subjects like Gamergate or whether game journalists accept bribes from game publishers or some more icky subjects depending on the situation, ChatGPT will pull up a narrative that will easily come off as if it was made up by a 4chan psyop like in Gamergate or just outright right wing propaganda in disguise. It all depends on what questions you're asking because for instance in the case of asking if and Frank had white privilege, chat GPT regains common sense, do not say anything anti-Semitic, but it looks like this AI has been trained by someone like Elon Musk as of late, and that might raise some suspicions as I will point later point out in this video. There's also the fact that this AI is already being used by media companies like BuzzFeed to replace wor human work after laying off several BuzzFeed employees, and so, so... Yeah, the situation with ChatGPT, especially considering this type of inaccurate information it pulls out can even lead to some legal ramifications, is that ChatGPT doesn't look like it's going to last very long, as it looks like a bubble. Anyway, back to the video. One of the later assumptions I made on where, again, does ChatGPT pull off the supposed fact about how Mike Moraski composed the Roblox oof sound is that I assume the AI just picked this really obscure Roblox oof remix of the Portal 2 ending music, otherwise I wouldn't believe it. So, I nearly gave up. And in a section of this video that I call This Should Have Been The End To Electric Boogaloo I was supposed to give up this very particular video, but then I found something. I decided I could somehow, as some sort of trolling attempt to Elon Musk, have the AI write a blog article for my website about Elon Musk's apartheid emerald mine business. You know, how Elon Musk inherited his fortune from his father's apartheid emerald mine business. This is not a conspiracy theory. Look it up on Google. And I did tell myself, maybe the AI could actually pull this off right. Boy, I said, was I wrong. So I tried set prompt on ChatGPT and the AI went on to chastise me about how it was so wrong and how Elon Musk is a self-made billionaire with a degree and blah 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 At this point it seemed apparent that it could be one of two things. Either the AI was coded by Elon Musk sims or either Elon Musk forced the AI to write this. It might surprise you, but it seemed like the latter was most likely the case. If you look up OpenAI, the creators of ChatGPT on Wikipedia, you'd know that Elon Musk is one of the co-founders of the company. 
He used to be one of the biggest backers of OpenAI, and even though it seems his involvement is minimal given the current circumstances, he takes a huge part of the ChatGPT business. Their situation is really dire, where you have to consider Elon Musk, according to sources, is willing to use ChatGPT to edit his most controversial tweets to modify them into less controversial ones. According to articles such as those from Yahoo Finance, Based on his public statements and actions, it appears that he has some concerns about the potential dangers of advanced AI and its potential impact on society. He has often spoken about the need of AI to be developed and used in a responsible and ethical manner, and has even founded organizations such as OpenAI to help advance his goal. Wow, in such case, bravo Elon, you just helped create an AI that can dangerously replace human creative jobs, creating false nonsense in the process. Thanks Elon, you fascist egotistical narcissist. It's not just that too, Elon has also plans to monetize the app given its sudden success in a way that ChatGPT might not be free anymore. So maybe a bunch of fucking oligarchic capitalists can still use the fucking app while everyone else is doomed to starve in this online ecosystem. It's clear that Elon Musk is an ego-driven narcissist, one that craves and needs controlling anything he deems necessary to control and as much as possible to feel himself better. He really thinks he's some sort of Tony Stark of the internet, and it's clearly evident that he only wants to surround himself with a horde of yes men all the time so he doesn't feel challenged. Take for instance what he's doing with Twitter policies. He gets made fun of all the time by everyone under the sun, so instead of thinking even a slight bit of deciding Twitter policies through regular Twitter poll tweets, he instead wants to pay all those polls deciding Twitter policies for only Twitter blue verified users. You know, the idiots who pay $8 a month for Twitter. He builds all these sorts of mythologies and legends around himself through his narratives on anything he touches, while anybody with two neurons can find out all the wrong stuff he's doing, which outweighs by miles the right stuff he's doing. For Jim Flynn's sake, he's tanking Tesla stocks now with a sheer incompetence at running Twitter. So bottom line of this, Elon Musk is a con man, a liar, a fraud, and Twitter is even worse every passing minute Elon Musk runs it. I made Elon Musk clown video for a reason. Fuck you. Okay, maybe lying online will obviously get you too much in trouble, like saying things will get you obviously all the time in jail. Just watch. I'm a certified forklift driver. See? Saying it didn't get me in trouble. Of course, it might honestly make me uncomfortable to some people, but lying to people isn't necessarily legally troubling. But there's an inherent problem with pushing false narratives on the internet so far that it's become to a point where anything you can find on the internet can be practically a Schrodinger scat that can be either both a truth or a lie, or can be neither a truth or a lie. And the internet as of late is made that way, and it's pretty scary. It's not just Elon Musk's whole mythology that set forth his trend of fake news and the sort, it also certainly happened a lot in 2016 Trump era, or hell, even anywhere else that sparks a tiny bit of controversy. But first, let's talk about SEO. SEO or search engine optimization is a usual tactic by businesses to position their business in search engines like Google. Oftentimes, it can either rely on what hats SEO, which are the recommended tactics by Google and the sword, or either rely on black hat SEO, which is basically things like keyword stuffing or Google bombing, etc. etc. A thing that a lot of these marketing and SEO companies do is keyword stuffing, and the end result of keyword stuffing is that, generally speaking, there are a lot of articles in media sites anywhere trying to fill paragraphs and paragraphs of useless somewhat related information next to the actual useful information so they can rank up higher in Google search results because A, users spend more time reading an article so Google can rank up higher. B. Users don't usually bounce back out of the site so Google don't penalize the site for such a thing. And C. It can rank up higher not just in one set of keywords, but also in other keywords as well. 
This is a problem as we speak because there's this constant rat race between different websites on who can rank up higher on Google and normal re results beyond page one of an average Google search are often ignored. People will always look up the first results on Google. And this is not the only problem considering a lot of media sites don't either disclose sponsor articles and such, so you don't know what if they're being un honest about a business they're somehow talking well about. Let's say a case scenario. If you look up for the lock combination Resident Evil 8 Village, you'll find plenty of first result articles that will not just bury you the exact combination for that lock, but it will also derail the article into telling you about who invented the lock in real life, about how the lock being in Harry Potter for some reason, about the lock's inventor's mom being an alcoholic, and about how locks in real life work. This has to be vomited into a blog article altogether, so Google ranks up the site even more. I'm not making this shit up. Now, people want to use ChatGPT to create similar blog articles that can get them viral. If after seeing what ChatGPT is able to make, this is a shit businesses want to do with ChatGPT, it will mean a catastrophic fate for the internet as a whole. It's not just that real creative blogger jobs might be replaced by a machine mind to machine computers making people lose jobs. It's also that it will distort reality and narrative so much that we don't know what's true or false online. And as a fellow certified forklift driver, I know that so that should be pretty scary to think. So going back to the original point of the video, the point I was unerringly avoiding to make, did Takafumi Fujisawa really make that PlayStation startup sound. I don't know. I, I mean, did he really? I, I don't know at this point if Fujisawa created start sound or anything. The PlayStation block could be lying at this point. All I know is that I already hate this video. I hate the internet. I hate Elon Musk. I hate the chat GPT. And someone should save me from this living hell. Please, someone help me. When I started researching for this video on the creator of the PlayStation startup sound, I had my hopes I will emulate the video that actually inspired me, the Roblox Oop Sound video made by the H Bomber guy. And now that I've come myself into the sort of rabbit hole that fell apart beneath my feet where I fell Wally Coyote style into, I cannot feel anything else other than the dread for the future of the internet as a whole. Back in the era of the dial-up modem sound in the 90s that I mentioned earlier, way earlier than that, the internet was conceived in the form of its multiple BBS ports as a way to gain free knowledge from anywhere in the world, without any sort of restrictions whatsoever, at least a great portion of it, so anyone from anywhere in the world could talk to each other and exchange knowledge that they didn't know before. Some of that nature is still in here with us today, but in a lesser degree, since shortly afterwards the internet was seized by corporate interests, hence the birth of the internet providers we know today. Now the internet is not free, at least you know, not if you can't afford a basic internet connection aside of getting food, shelter, or at least a normal computer or a smartphone. You wouldn't hear that famous dial-up modem sound I mentioned earlier in this video if you couldn't afford back the, then a basic dial-up modem connection or a phone connection. With the rise of corporate interest around the internet came a bunch of business small practices with the aforementioned black hat SEO that forces your average from your average blogger to the mainstream media site to fill up or bury useful information in vomited keyword stuffing so they can rank up higher on Google. And now with the advent of using apps like ChatGPT so the AI can clumsily write for you blog articles without any basic cohesion or logical sense of facts, the line between what's true and what's false blurs even more in the post-truth era of the internet. A lot of people will say knowledge is power, but with the problems accessing true knowledge about things for average people like you and me, and relegating true knowledge to only a bunch of rich billionaire oligarchs willing to distort reality for the rest, it's harder to regain such power from to, for the average people even more. I already talked about how AI like OpenAI's ChatGPT, which is made in part by an egocentric fascist billionaire like Elon Musk, can destroy the jobs of regular creative people and even then cannot easily replace human creatives without them much and so much 
and natural inference is on false, like putting six fingers into a portrait or coming up with completely false facts about video game composers. But it gets even worse when companies are willing to replace us by these machines for profit, worsening the internet habitat even more. So maybe Takafumi Fujisawa made the iconic PlayStation startup sound, or maybe he didn't. I originally intended to come up with a real conclusion on who really made that sound effect at the end of the day. But the point I, that I now want to get across is that with this current post-truth ecosystem of the internet where you don't even know what's true or false anymore, I don't think people are gonna even trust Snopes anymore on whether Elon Musk did or did not have an apartheid emerald mine inheritance at this moment. All I'm saying is, we need to fight back against this. We need to be aware of true sources of knowledge and be wary of those who just want to sell smoke. And by that, I mean, we need to stop Elon Musk from taking over and smash capitalism. Thank you for watching. Hmm. Order.